Dawa Films, Ali. I tried to squeeze this all into one video and, well, that's just not going to happen. First off, you claimed ignorance on any part of the Quran that instructs followers to disrespect the infidels, the unbelievers. Well, I'll scroll some of those passages through here, uh, just from the Quran, that instruct or encourage intolerance and disrespect toward disbelievers. Next, obsession. I didn't expect you to treat my video with a great deal of honesty, but I'm still disappointed that you didn't. Your response is more of a vehicle for ad hominems than it is any kind of counter to any of the points I made. The title of your video suggests I'm fixated on pedophilia, so even before the first frame of the video plays, you've already misrepresented myself and my argument. I think my video clearly shows that I don't care how you define pedophilia, or even if you affix that name to your alleged profit. Next. Subscribers. You claim that my video is an attempt to gain subscribers for my channel. I don't care if my channel has 10 or 10,000 subscribers. I certainly don't care if I absorb any of your fanbots. If I wanted subscribers, I'd pull some stunt like Threaten Thunderfoot. Next. Style. Your video is dripping with condescension and insults. Your first priority seems to be on delivering the insult rather than attempting to educate. The insults don't bother me, as they indicate a certain desperation in the defense. You know what your YouTube username means, but some of the viewers may not. Dawa is the practice of engaging someone, usually through a dialogue, with the objective to invite people to understand Islamic life, or to encourage them to understand your alleged prophet and his teachings. Essentially, practicing Dawa is being a missionary, with the ideal result, of course, being to produce converts to Islam. Do you really think that your attitude is inviting, or that your brash insults are really encouraging people to understand the wonder and worship of Allah? I'll tell you that you certainly give the appearance of being little more than a pompous cheerleader, eager to hear the bleating praise and braying adulation of your own fanbots. Again, I urge you to reconsider your style if your intention is truly dawa, but with each video of yours I see more and more evidence that it is not. Next. Fixation. You say that I also fixated on just one part of your evidence. Well, yes, but it is not because it is the only part I can address. As I mentioned in my video, most of the points I wish to address about your video were made in another video, one made by Klingshore and Snowwalker1, to which I linked. I'm not certain why you felt this was important to mention. Next. Burden of proof. If the preparation and defense of a thesis lies in your future, you had better understand clearly the burden of proof and how it's argued. Your claim that I can't comment on your evidence unless I have an argument or evidence of my own that provides a better explanation is patently ridiculous. Your presented case consists of a bunch of maybes, which could be applied to a group. This is called conjecture, and you have not produced one solid piece of evidence that Aisha was pubescent. That is your claim, not mine. The burden of proof is yours on that positive claim. When you present a hypothesis as a keystone fact on which the rest of your conjecture follows, yes, I can call you on it. You stated I dismissed the paper as not credible and having no certainty. No, I merely observed that it doesn't meet a terribly high standard of peer review. As an example of the implications of this, I will again point you to Andrew Wakefield, you know, the Vaccines Cause Autism guy, whose paper, published in a well-respected peer-reviewed journal, has been solidly and repeatedly discredited and his medical license has been revoked. Another example, the Discovery Institute has their own peer-reviewed journal, quote-unquote, so they can add an appearance of legitimacy to their own fantasy world of creation science. You state that evolutionists scream for peer-reviewed studies. That doesn't mean that anything published will do, nor does it mean that all papers published in peer-reviewed journals are peer-reviewed studies of equal value to each other. Because you're the one making the claim of knowledge that Aisha specifically was psychosocially mature enough at the age of six years to willingly, independently, and knowingly enter into a marriage contract, and three years later pubescent enough to withstand the physical punishment on a child's body of having that marriage consummated, and knowing precisely what she was doing in both cases, and the implications thereof, the burden of proof rests on you, and you have not met that burden. Next. Evolution. You demand that your conjecture can only be refuted by evolutionary evidence. This is also ridiculous. You claim that evolutionists have to believe that the age of puberty has never changed in order to comment on your claim. I believe no such thing. I accept that human development likely changed as humans developed from the early primate ancestors. To suggest, however, that evolution moves quickly enough to radically change something like this over such an evolutionarily short period of time, it is, let's say, unrealistic. 
Let's take a closer look. We both agree to a point that the onset of puberty is dependent on many non-evolutionary factors. Impact on the variances of puberty has more to do with the immediate postnatal environment than the slow progress of evolution. Most of these factors have a tendency to delay sexual maturity. The adjustment is primarily in one direction, and that's away from the target age you're trying to reach with the case you're constructing on Aisha. Poor nutrition, low body fat, and so on all contribute to delaying the sexual maturity in girls. The only exception you provide in there that supports your claim is the bit that you focus on about the developing fetus being able to somehow predict its postnatal nutritional environment and adjusting its developmental trajectory based on that prediction. It doesn't specifically say that claim... It doesn't specifically say with that claim that it will significantly shorten the time to sexual maturity, but you could read it to imply that, which of course you did. This has some potential, if true, to be a good piece of evidence, but it seemed odd for the authors to throw this out there and then move right along. I noticed that the claim had a reference number. This paper you're using was written by Gluckman and Hansen in 2005. You know what that reference number on this claim pointed to? A paper also written by Gluckman and Hansen in 2004, which postulated this claim. Now, I'm not saying that that's a magic bullet against your claim, but it does at the very least put another wobbly wheel in the already faltering clockwork of your conjecture. The argument goes on to include studies that show maturation rates differing in insects and comparing it to what they propose may happen in humans. Now, this is a bit of a stretch. You see, one of the major differences that sets us apart from all other animals, including the rest of the primates, is our big brain. A very long period of childhood development to reach maturity is the price we pay as a species for having a brain significantly larger and magnitudes more capable than our primate cousins. This significant difference and evolutionary cost goes against applying data observed in a totally different class of animals who undergo a different developmental process, especially if you are doing as these researchers are and approaching it from an evolutionary perspective. I wonder why the researchers chose to use insects as the example for this bit of conjecture instead of other primates. Maybe it's because primate studies don't give them the data that allows them to postulate this. Using rhesus monkeys as an example for other primates paper, we see puberty beginning in females on average at age 24 months, monarchy at 32 months in first ovulation or period occurring at 45 months or just short of four years old. The study sets the averages for the same ages in human girls at just over 10 years for the start of puberty, monarchy at 12 and first ovulation at over 13. Now, rhesus monkeys don't have the extended childhood development as we have, and since rhesus monkeys' life expectancy is considerably less than ours, when we consider the points along the arc of their lifespan at which these events happen and do the same to ours, is the result all that different? Also, it might interest you to know that females are typically not physically ready for intercourse until puberty is nearly complete, and essentially at the point of ovulation, not at the onset of puberty. So you should be looking at the upper end of your windows, not the lower end. Returning to the beginning of this point for a moment, other evidence you present out of the Gluckman Hansen paper talks about factors that delay sexual maturity, but you read right over it, seemingly oblivious to what it's actually saying. And in the final bit of evidence you provide, you ignore a key part of what you're reading off, the part that contains important contextual information that makes the information invalid for the situation you're trying to apply it to. So there's your conjecture handled in a little more detail. Feel better now? I'll continue in the next video.